All right. So last time I read, uh, they were talking about money because Vince is obsessed with money, right? And uh, Vince was talking about how he needs to um, find a way to get in contact with the pint-sized moonbeam workers that his grandma keeps pulling money out of her purse from, right? Because Vince is worried about money. Why is Vince worried about money? And they just got rid of a whole bunch of money because they had to pay bullies. They had to pay the bullies to help get rid of what's his name? Staples. Staples. Later that day, Joe, Brady, and I stood on the edge of the upper grade playground and watched as Kitten approached the recess supervisor. We could clear, we could see every inch of the playground from our carefully chosen spot. Kitten tugged at the edge of the RS's shirt. She turned around and smiled when she saw who it was. Adults adored Kitten, as if he were the greatest thing since the advent of manners. Adults just went crazy over the whole dress pants, nice hair, sweaters, and dress shirt thing. Plus, he used please and thank you more than any kid I knew, and those were like drugs to adults. We watched as Kitten started talking to her. He pointed at something down near the goalpost at the football field. Then he grabbed her hand and led her away. She was happy to follow, of course. Kitten didn't talk much normally, but man, could he tell long and pointless stories like a pro when he needed to. And for some reason, adults always found his stories really cute and interesting. As soon as I was sure that Kitten had the RS's complete attention for the duration of his story, I turned my hand over and passed a small mirror under the sun's light. I saw it reflect brightly across the playground to where Vince was waiting for my single signal. He nodded in our direction and gave his own signal to little Paul, except Vince's signal was a massive sneeze so obnoxiously loud and overdone that I thought I'd blow the whole operation by laughing myself to death. Little Paul heard the signal and then approached Barnaby Willis, who was playing basketball with some seventh and eighth graders. Little Paul walked right into the middle of their game. He was one brave little kid, that was for sure. They all stopped and watched as he walked up to the kid with the ball, took it from his hands, and marched right up to Willis. Willis towered over him by at least a few feet. But that didn't stop Little Paul for a second. What he did next went a little above and beyond what I'd instructed him to do, but it still worked. He threw the ball right at the collector's face. It bounced off the collector's nose with a rubber pop that sounded like he just bricked it off the rim. Everybody on, our, on this side of the playground gasped. The little Paul took off running. Then little Paul took off running. Willis followed just like he knew he would, like we knew he would. A guy like the collector doesn't let a little kid get away with disrespecting him in public. Little Paul was a fast kid and he easily stayed ahead of Willis as he ran toward the portables. The portables are these spe three spe small buildings that the school built to help specialty classes. Like for the kids who are LD or MR or ADHD or ADD or JLCA or GKD or TNIF or whatever other letters adults label kids with these days. Behind the portables is the official fighting rank. Everybody knows that if you're going to fight somebody, you take it behind the portables. The portables have no windows and the recess supervisor never goes back there. Plus, with the portables all side by side, there's enough room for a whole crowd of kids to watch without being seen. The spot has been used so many times that a large circle of trampled dirt has replaced the nice green glass grass. Little Paul led the collector around to the back of the portables. As soon as he cleared the end portable, Vince gave the other bullies their signal. They descended upon Willis like a pack of starving monkeys at a flea market. What happened next was pretty hard to watch, in all honesty. Willis was a crying mess by the end, and to add insult to injury, the bullies even stole his wallet and shoes. And finally prying Snapper off his ankle, the bullies told Willis that if he ever collected one more kid, they'd collect him twice as hard next time. I made eye contact with Vince during the aftermath. I could tell he was thinking the same thing I was. What have we done? I'd be lying if I didn't admit that the whole thing made me feel horrible for the rest of the day, even in spite of what the collector had tried to do to me on Tuesday. But what mattered was that the collector was out of commission, which meant it was now time to fix the problem at the, at the source, getting kids to stop placing bets. If we cut off the supply of gamblers, then the money would stop coming in. If the money stopped flowing, then Staples, Staples business at my school would collapse. Easy as pie. Or, as Vince's grandma sometimes says, easy as dressing up like a tree to catch wombats. Why does Vince's grandma say that? 
Mrs. Grimma has dementia. <laughs> After school that day, I found a surprise in my locker. Not a good one, though. I opened my locker to put away some books and get my Cubs hat. And there it was, staring at me with, with the type of vacant look that only death can supply. A dead rat. I was just barely able to hold back a yell. I think probably the only reason I didn't make a fool of myself right then and there was because the rat was lying on top of, on the top shelf of my locker. It was actually pretty small and white, like the kind that are in the school science lab, and not a huge gray beast like you see in movies that eat small deer for snacks and would give you the bubonic plague. After I reminded myself that it was really just a mouse after all, I nudged it onto a piece of paper and tossed it in the garbage. Although the dead rat had been gross, it wasn't that wasn't what was that what that but that wasn't what was bothering me. It was the message it was supposed to send. I looked around inside my locker and found the note I knew it would be there. I unfolded the piece of paper on the simple me on it was a simple message handwritten. Friends of rats end up dead. Give us Fred by the end of tomorrow or you'll be roadkill. Vince showed up just as I finished reading the note. What's that? He asked. It's nothing, I said as I tossed the note into my locker and slammed it shut. I decided not to tell anybody. They'd just panic. The last thing I needed was Joe and Vince panicking. Besides, there was no way I was going to just hand over Fred. Not now. We were way past that. Oh, Vince said. What? No joke? He shrugged. Nah, I'm not really in the mood for jokes. Something was up. Vince was al almost always in the mood for jokes. The longest he ever went without making a joke was after his dad died. That was about four years ago. For two weeks after he afterward, he and I just hung out in the old trailer park playground. We didn't really do much. We just sat on the swings next to each other, and I pretended not to notice that Vince was crying. I don't think he was ever embarrassed about it. I think he was just happy to have me there, and that was good enough for me. I remember feeling helpless. Here I was, the kid who had the answers to everyone's problems, but I had no answer for Vince. There was no trick I could pull off that would bring my best friend's dad back. I'd have, I'd have given up anything, just for, but it just wasn't possible. Eventually, Vince had to sort of, sort of found, Vince sort of found a way to move on. But it still bothers me to this day that I hadn't been able to do more for him when he needed it most. What's wrong, Vince? I asked. Nothing, just a bad day at school, he said. I nodded, but I wasn't sure I believed him. He's too smart to have bad days at school. In fact, I'm pretty sure he's smarter than every teacher he's had, but I let it go. Everybody was allowed to be in a bad mood once in a while. Say, I'm going to head to the office after school to get over to go over some numbers so you guys can head out without me and I'll see you tonight. I'll, I'll still see you tonight, though, for the game, Vince said. Sure thing, I said. Vince had never spent much time at the office alone before. I was starting to get a little concerned. I guess the Cubs actually being good was affecting him more than I'd thought. That night, Vince and Joe came over to hang out and discuss some regular business matters. Joe left when Vince and I switched the TV to the Cubs game at 7. Baseball is so boring. How can you stand watching it all the time? Joe said as he got up to leave. What? I said. Not if you know what you're watching, it isn't. Baseball is the thinking person's game. Plus, I mean, it's the Cubs, Vince said. He looked at Joe with concern, like a doctor might look at a patient with a massive head injury. An injury. Joe laughed and called us crazy one more time before leaving. All right, Vince, I've got a good one for you, I said as the first inning got underway. Give me your best shot, trivia master, Vince said sarcastically. It was a relief to see that humorous glow back in his eyes. I guess whatever he'd done, done back at the office after school had cheered him up. Okay, that, okay then, in 19... 30, which Cub had one of the greatest offensive season in baseball history with 51 homers and 191 RBI? Ooh, that is a tough one, but uh, you'll have to do a little bit better than that, ne better next time, Mac. The answer is Hack Wilson. Look up Hack Wilson. <clears throat> Whatever, you cheater, I said. Right. How can I cheat at trivia? I can't help it if my brain just happens to hold more Cubs knowledge because I'm a bigger fan than you. Oh, yeah, it's real. Real person? I grinned and threw a handful of popcorn at him. After a few minutes, Vince's face got serious. What is it, Vince? Mac, you do realize we're not going to be able to afford to go to the game at this rate, right? Vince said. What do you mean? Mac, you just promised those bullies almost $200 for beating up Willis. That's a lot of cash, my friend. We don't really have the money for payouts like that. He sounded as worried as I had heard him in years, and maybe even a little angry. We'll be okay, don't worry. Once we get the get the staple thing taken care of, then we'll just work extra hard to make it up, make up for it. 
I said. If Vince was telling me we wouldn't have enough, then that was probably true. Vince was almost never wrong when it came to money. Then again, he was also overly cautious when it came to our finances. Do we really have to pay everybody so much? They probably would have worked for less, Vince said. Yeah, okay, I'll try to be more careful. Sorry. I just think I'd snap if the Cubs made it to, made it this year and we missed out on the game. Plus, it's not like these kids need our money all that bad. These are bullies, Mac. They steal other kids' lunch money. I just think that if we're going to blow our chances to go to the Cubs World Series game, then it should be for a better cause.